Hello everyone. Today from the subject of ophthalmology, we will be discussing about the lacrimal gland anatomy. The lacrimal gland anatomy can be studied under four main headings. The main lacrimal gland, the accessory lacrimal glands, the passages, the lacrimal canalicula, lacrimal sac, nasolacrimal duct, and the arterial and nerve supply of the lacrimal gland. Now let us study each of these by first looking at the diagram. Now as you can see here, this is the highlighted blue portion part is the lacrimal gland. It is seen here having two parts, the orbital part and the palpebral part. Both of these will release secretion via certain ducts which are not shown here because of the dissection and will release the tear in the, in the eye which will be drained by two holes which are seen here known as lacrimal puncta or in latin puncta lacrimalia from these two holes the secretion are then drained via two small tubes known as lacrimal canaliculi from the lacrimal canaliculi it goes into a storage site known as lacrimal sac from which it is released in the inferior meters via the nasolacrimal duct now coming to the <coughs> lacrimal gland proper the main one the main lacrimal gland has two parts an orbital part the palpebral part the orbital part is classically referred to as uh, having a shape and a size of that of a small almond it has two surfaces an outer convex surface and an inner concave surface the outer convex surface is along the side of the bone that is the uh, frontal plate of the orbit along the upper outer aspect snugly fit into the lacrimal fossa and the inner concave surface is along the palpebral part of the lacrimal gland. However, both are separated by a thin layer of the aponeurosis of the levator palpebris superioris muscle. Now, orbital part will re release its secretion via certain ducts. Along the course of these ducts is present the palpebral part. The palpebral part has one or two lobules along the course of the ducts and most of its secretion lies along the ducts which merges along the ducts of the orbital part. Now here is one interesting point. If by via a certain surgical intervention the orbital part is removed, then the functional anatomy of the main lacrimal gland is still intact because of the presence of palpebral part and the ducts that arise from it. However, if the palpebral part is removed for a certain surgical operation, then because the palpebral part is along the ducts of the orbital part, then the functional aspect of the entire lacrimal gland is smooth, means it is <coughs> removed. Now, the histology of the main lacrimal gland. The histology of the main lacrimal gland resembles that of the salivary gland because of its seroacinar nature, which can be seen in this diagram. The histology part is not much important clinically, however, two interesting points here I'd like to show you. One is this, the lymphocyte present here. The magnified version of this is this one. The lymphocyte secretes the IgA antibodies which are present along the tears. And here is the myopithelocyte. This will contract and this will release the tear secretion uh, from the sinus to the ducts. You can see various colors of the secretory cells. This is because of the varied electron density as is this seen by the electron microscope. <coughs> now after the histology, we continue with our gross anatomy. Now the ducts, approximately 10 to 12 ducts comes out from the main lacrimal gland. Most of these ducts, approximately 10 in number, will release a secretion along the lateral aspect of the superior fornix. However, a couple of those, approximately 1 to 2, will release a secretion along the lateral aspect of the inferior fornix. Now the tear secretion is released and it ultimately drains via these two holes seen here, this and this. This is known as lacrimal puncta. The lacrimal puncta are approximately 6 to 6.5 mm lateral to the uh, lateral from the medial or the inner canthus along the junction between the ciliary and the non-ciliary aspect of the eyelid. 
Now the lacrimal puncta can be associated with a protrusion known as lacrimal papilla surrounding it, which is more commonly found in the elderly age group. From the lacrimal papilla, the secretion goes to the lacrimal canaliculi. Now this can be seen better in the next diagram shown here. This is the coronal section along the right side and hence this is the little part and this is the medial part. The lacrimal canaliculi has two parts, a vertical part and a horizontal part. The vertical part is approximately 2 mm in length, the horizontal part approximately 8 mm in length and both of them converges along this part known as lacrimal ampulla or simply ampulla. Now both this upper and lower canaliculi can merge to form a common canaliculus and drain into the lacrimal sac or it can drain separately into the lacrimal sac. If it drain by forming a common canaliculus then there might be a mucosal flap which is commonly found to prevent a reflux of tear secretion that has reached the sac back to the canaliculi. This is known as the valve of Rosenmuller. Now, after the tear secretion has reached lacrimal sac, we come to this part. The lacrimal sac has a is made up of a fibroelastic tissue. That means that it is capable of distension, and hence on distended, did uh, on and hence on distension, its dimension reaches up to a length of fifteen millimeter and a breadth of up to five to six millimeter. However. Conventionally, we say that the length of the lacrimal sac is approximately 10 mm. Now, the lacrimal sac has three parts. A part here known as fundus, this part known as the body and a constriction or rather a narrowing that continues along the nasolacrimal duct. This part will be known as the neck. Now, <clears throat> after the secretion reaches the lacrimal sac, it is released into the nasolacrimal duct. The nasolacrimal duct has a wide range of length, 12 to 24 mm, however we commonly associate with 18 mm in length, continues from the lacrimal sac, releases its secretion in the inferior meatus and it is present along a bony canal which is formed by the maxilla, this part along the and the inferior concha, both the contribute to form the bony canal. The nasolacrimal duct is narrow, more narrowed superiorly than inferiorly and it is covered by several mucosal fold. One of which is most important, this is known as the valve of Hessner. It has similar function as the valve of Rosenmuller, that is it prevents reflux, retrograde reflux, means retrograde flow of the tear secretion that has reached the inferior meatus back to the nasolacrimal duct. Now the direction of the nasolacrimal duct is downwards, laterally and backwards and the surface anatomy can be expressed as simply a line drawn from the inner canthus to the groove between the ella and the cheek. Now coming back towards this lacrimal sac, actually the region, the bony region surrounding the lacrimal sac that is simply a fossa which holds the lacrimal sac. It is formed by two bones, the lacrimal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla. Now, <coughs> the it is present in between two crests, uh, the anterior lacrimal crest and the posterior lacrimal crest and a condensation of the periorbital tissue known as lacrimal fascia. This lacrimal fascia forms a covering of the lacrimal sac. One important thing here is the orbiculus oculi muscle. The orbiculus oculi muscle as you can see here, its superficial head attaches anteriorly, its deep head attaches posteriorly. Now, I repeat once again, <coughs> the superficial head of the orbicular oculi will <coughs> attach anteriorly to the lacrimal sac and the deep head of the orbicular oculi will attach posterior to the, posteriorly to the lacrimal sac. However, some of the fibers of the deep head will attach to the lacrimal sac itself, which will be important in the discussion regarding the physiology of the lacrimal apparatus. <coughs> now, coming back to the topic. Oh yes, one more thing. The lacrimal sac 
if we look at it through the lateral surface of the nasal cavity, we can see that the lacrimal sac is related so, uh, inferiorly along the middle meatus and superiorly with the anterior group of the ethmoidal the paranasal sinus or an, an anterior group of ethmoidal air cells. This will be again important regarding discussing the spread of inflammation of the lacrimal sac and the sources through which it gets inf uh, it's get, it gets its inflammation or rather its infection. We have discussed the lacrimal apparatus as a whole except the accessory lacrimal glands. Now the thing is accessory lacrimal glands are microscopic however the histological structure is almost similar to the main lacrimal gland itself. There are two main glands associated here the gland of cross and the gland of wolf ring. The gland of cross is present beneath the fornix along the edge of the tarsus here. This is the upper eyelid and you can see this one here it is written here. The gland of wolf ring is present along the superior border of the upper tarsal plate, superior tarsal plate and the inferior edge of the inferior tarsus. Uh, you can see it here, this one, 11, gland of wolf ring. Now these are the accessory lacrimal glands and hence excision of the entire main lacrimal gland doesn't make the eye is prone to dry eye immediately because of this presence of accessory lacrimal gland. It maintains a status of hydration. Now we have discussed the lacrimal gland apparatus actual, uh, along with the accessory lacrimal glands. Now we come to the arterial and the nerve supply. The arterial supply is easy. It's the lacrimal artery which is a branch of uh, ophthalmic artery which supplies the main lacrimal gland. The nerve supply is a bit interesting. It contains mainly three parts. The parasympathetic part, which is basically the secretomotor part, the sympathetic part and the sensory part. The sensory part is by the lacrimal nerve, which is a the branch of ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The parasympathetic, that, the, that is the secretomotor, arises from the superior salivatory nucleus which I have written as the lacrimatory nucleus, basically saying that the superior salivatory is the main source of the secretion. Uh, the superior salivatory nucleus fibers will come, then it will pass along the greater petrosal nerve to the pterygopalatine ganglion, ultimately to the lacrimal gland itself. The sympathetic branches will pass through the superior cervical ganglion, from the superior cervical ganglion via the internal carotid plexus, again deep petrosal, which will form the median nerve along the greater petrosal uh, along with the greater petrosal nerve, then <coughs> uh, then the pterygopalatine and ultimately to the lacrimal gland. Uh, yes, these three are the main sensory, sympathetic, and parasympathetic. The three nerve supplies of the lacrimal gland itself. So we have discussed the main lacrimal gland, the accessory lacrimal gland, the passages, and the arterial and nerve supply. Here are the numerical data that I have said just for revision. Alright, this is all. Thank you.